October is Filipino American History Month, and we would like to thank Filipino Community Inc. for partnering with us on tonight's presentation. And I'd also like to thank the Friends of the Alaska State Library, Archives, and Museum for sponsoring tonight's event. We have Oscar Pinarada here with us, who flew in from San Francisco. Oscar worked for 15 seasons in Alaska canneries doing jobs from patching salmon, working the can line, and he also worked as a union representative. Oscar's stories, poems, and essays have been published nationally and internationally. He founded the San Francisco chapter of the Filipino American National Historical Society and advocated to establish an ethnic studies program at San Francisco State University where he later taught. Oscar was recognized by the Writers Guild of the Philippines for his lifetime achievements in promoting and pioneering the institutionalization of Philippine studies, Philippine American studies, and the Philippine language studies in the United States. Thank you, Oscar, for making your 16th trip to Alaska and to be with us here tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, Jackie. I am uh, deeply honored to be part of this uh, project that you guys have. And I do it for, I guess, my comrades who work with me in Alaska. Now, um, Sometimes uh, people wonder, you know, what are you doing working like this? You know, you're, you're in school, you're, um, you're an academic, you're supposed to be there. But to me, you know, doing different parts of life is, is really just one thing in your life. So that when people uh, say that um, you work you know, one in, there was. You know, we keep we keep time cards in in the canneries when I was working, and I kept the time cards for five older men. I was 21 when I started, so I was a very young man when I started working in Alaska. And the five um, Filipino men that I one was Mexican, though they didn't really uh, they just signed their name any old way. So I, I collected their time time card, and I swear one day I, we worked 26 and a half hours. <laughs> You know, I know there's only 24 hours, but no one's going to take that one and a half hours away from me because I worked my ass off during the 26 and a half figuring it out. <clears throat> so I got, we all got paid for that. And Jackie was saying that sometimes, because I'm from the academic field, um, sometimes uh, people introduce me as Dr. Oscar Penuranda. And I was telling <laughs> Manny, uh, man, uh, the, um, Jackie, that, you know, I don't technically have a PhD because that's what that doctors are for, you know, I only have a master's degree. Although I was uh, offered a PhD program in Stanford, I said no, I was really sick and tired of school. Uh, and, <laughs> for the, and we'll start with that poem that I wrote, uh, explaining my, uh, I guess, my letter to the world. It's called an apology. Um, do I, this one? For I have done with lectures, I have had enough of books to last me for a spell. I want to learn whatever there is to learn that is not in between, that is not written. So that was. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, we practice this, but so expect some mistakes. All right. <clears throat> and I will begin by, uh, before showing you um, a lot of the experiences that uh, where did you go? <clears throat> yeah. Every time I drop something, I never find it, you know? It's, I drop it here, it's over there someplace. I don't, I don't get it. <clears throat> this poem I call the Migrant's Roll Call because there's not only, because there's two, there are really two kinds of Alas uh, Alaska visitors that in my days were called Alaskeros. So I was an Alaskero who was not really a native of Alaska. They visited Alaska when it was time to work the salmon, the halibut, the crab, the shrimp, and everything else. I had a, I had a colleague who worked Alaska 11 out of the 12 months doing all those things. He would go home to San, San Francisco, and his wife would have his suitcase ready for him to get out again. Then <laughs> he's only there for one month. <clears throat> and this is a... So the, the farm workers were also migrants, so many migrants. And so, so to me, I, I, 
because of my experience, it all I, I lumped them all in one, and I, I dedicated this uh, this poem for them. It's called the Migrants' Roll Call. You know, people always have a roll call. You know, they call their names, but if you're a migrant worker, they don't have such things. They don't even know your name. No. <clears throat> Manung Blackie from Stockton, Lomboy of Portland, Oregon. Mr. Lomboy to you, son. And three-fingered Larry of Delano Town. Were there three fingers left or were there three fingers gone? We don't know. <laughs> My Auntie Emma from Seattle, Alaska, extraordinaire. They are not in the pages of history books, yet they made history. Bent like the very grapes that they harvested Bent in the burning heat, sun up to sundown, they put fruits on your table, yet they themselves could not afford the fruits of their own labor. They raised their fists and laid them down again to pave the paths of justice for our future. Boy Sigi Sigi, Freddy Eagle, Slim Gator, and the Wolfman from Fair Santa Clara, an ex Al Capone hitman who wore panties to work. <laughs> the secret to long hours, he told me. More support, buddy, more comfort. <laughs> who am I to argue with the guy? He's an ex-killer, I'm not arguing with him. <laughs> who lived in the same senior apartment house that my dad lived in, in San Francisco, south of Market, Clementina Street, Soma, Central City, by St. Patrick's Church. No read, no write, but work like hell drink like hell and gamble like there was no tomorrow. And for some, there was no tomorrow. They died with their Alaskan boots, their Alaskan canneries boots on. For my parents and aunties and uncles who raised me, sacrificed and taught me how to sacrifice for the good of the many, for the good of the, le of the weaker ones, for the good of the loved ones, for you, my ancestors from my homeland, for you, my ancestors who have traveled far and away from the homeland and into the loveless fields of the diaspora, I sing these limping words of praise and I ask you all now for a brief moment as their obscure lives were for a brief moment in time to honor them by remembering, for memory can be a witness to their labors and accomplishments their footprints are all over the world, yet they remain unknown. Vera, the native laundry lady from South Naknek village, who had to contend with our sometimes stained underwear, that brown badge of labor, every Tuesday laundry day, fancy pants called the vagina in Filipino, <laughs> Sansipuki, <laughs> that was his nickname, Chavacan the Mexican, my sometime roommate, loud snoring Ing the Chinaman, and Mr. Hollywood with sunglasses on from San Francisco. The guy worked with sunglasses every day. He had his clean, he had manicured everything together. <laughs> Mr. Hollywood, <clears throat> I hear you. I hear you all. Together we shall pluck you each by each out of the dustbins of history. If you listen carefully with a mind thirsty for the truth, in a heart that's pure, from fields to big cities and small cities and suburbs and towns, lakes, rivers, high seas and bays, from the silences and the noise, from the green grass that blow wild in the meadow. If you listen carefully, you may hear the wind whisper their names. Oka of old Frisco town, Manung Oka now, and still a prince of the island Leyte, all of you, Lay down your sore and aching dreams at my feet, and these crippled words will give them wings to set us free. Thank you. Thanks. So I went to Alaska in 1966. I was 21 years old. I was, um, I guess, 90% uh, of all the sins I've committed in the world, I learned in Alaska. <laughs> but uh, at least 1% was to ask for forgiveness. So I got everything OK now. <clears throat> everything's OK now. <clears throat> I was 
um, in, uh, I was telling uh, Jackie that as I was working, you know, if you're an artist in any kind of form, you need to find your own way of, of, of expressing yourself. You need to find your own voice. So as a writer, I really was writing. I, you know, I, I knew I could write. I knew I had my stories. Nobody else could write them. I had that feeling. But I could not find my voice. And I know that you really uh, cannot maximize your writing and fulfill the vision that you have as an artist until you find your voice. You know? And when I worked to Alaska, those are the people who helped me find my voice. These guys here. That's why, until today, there are really only two things that, you know, I'm, I'm not a talkative person. I'm, I'm talking now because I'm getting paid for it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a talkative person, but um, if you talk about two things, my childhood and Alaska, you'll never shut me up. You know? <laughs> Just those two, though. <laughs> And in 1966, I was writing poems, I was working, I'm, everything was intense. And I will read to you and, and show you about three or four of those poems that, that uh, I got so, to sort of um, help you uh, experience some of the things emotionally and physically, okay? This is the toilet bowl. I was telling earlier that fish was coming, who was, uh, you, uh, you right? Fish was in those years. Fish was coming out of everywhere, coming out of toilet bowls everywhere. You know, <laughs> it was broken, so they yanked it out and left it outside, among the littered cups and coffee sacks, and in the light of day, on the long and empty harbor. So I saw this toilet bowl, right in the middle of the walk, going to the docks. <laughs> so I said, "Man, that." That thing is talking to me, so, <laughs> so here, here, here it is. <laughs> and uh, I, I think, oh, two things. Uh, you know, Alaska, too, is in the middle of summer, so, you know, in the middle of summer, and in, in the summer, the summertime sort of, um, as I'll tell you a little bit later on, um, uh, symbolize the, uh, the youth of life, you know, your summer and everything's bright, and, and, and you know, people usually go to Alaska and, and you know, we, we fall in love too, or we think we fall in love. You know? and this is the time that the narrator, you know, when a poet writes a poem, please don't associate it with me right away. I know I wrote it, right? <laughs> but associate it with the speaker, speaker always. Let me read it to you. He's looking for berries. This is uh, um, the, um, the provenance of this poem is from a, uh, I think she was 16, I was 20. Two, two, three, but it was a big gap. She was just a, a little girl to me. It was her older sister that I really liked, but she liked somebody else as usual, right? <laughs> and she told me, have you ever had Eskimo ice cream? I, said, I forgot Eskimo ice cream or something. I said, no, I, I like ice cream generally. So she said that we make it with berries, we do this. And so we looked for berries to make the ice cream. <clears throat> and here it is. Unsure and helpless, we looked for stray berries. Though it wasn't the season, we combed the hill of low bushes until the earth from our silence burst the flame and its fragrance bloomed shameless in our steadfast eyes. And we got too tired, too tired for words, unsure and helpless. We lay there mattressed by the grass-speared slope of a cliff for a whisper of a summer when the green river swilled, swelled shimmering in the sunlight and the seas by the bay unfurled, and the, and the skies pressed close and damp like tombstones. The darkness rose from the crawling land while the candy lights played and laughed in the villages below, daring and holding the night's coming at bay. For the, great, for the spent sun was moving away, and the moon was getting ready to step out through the trees. <clears throat> and this is the poem that I sent uh, to Jackie and, and uh, the, the folks here because, um, you know, this is, uh, I guess I'm the type of writer who, who finds uh, meaning in trivial things, you know, many trivial subjects that I have, and, and, and this is one of them. Um, Alaska Filipino bunkhouse, lights out. Curled up like brown puppies, they would cuddle alone at nights or early mornings in their spring soggy beds. 
the veterans would have put a slab of plywood stolen from the white machinists under rotting mattresses for their aching and irreplaceable backs, each retreating under a blanket of separate dreams that, during the routine of never-ending work, wrap about them like stubborn sheets of Alaskan rain and wind, thinking, perhaps, of staying and living the winter there, tired not from the skillful maneuvering of salmon round the clock, but from arguing all night which one the white woman at the store stole a glance at that day. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> I mean, if it's not the salmon, why not? <laughs> OK. Um, this one, uh, which one is this? Oh, yes, one more, yeah. Um, the graveyard in South Naklik, um, Alaska Packers, the graveyard was situated in a place that's really awkward. You, you got, anywhere you go, you have to cross. The, you, you cannot avoid it. No, so I, I wrote something about that, that yard. <clears throat> Real estate. No one tends to do weeds anymore. That's all right. I understand. I'm an old graveyard of a small salmon fishing village in the middle of nowhere, South Naknek, Alaska, Boomtown, USA. I hold many more than those markers indicate. Corroded stones, tilted, balding wreaths. In the slant of rain, I hold many more. And no one knows who planted them, and no one knows who's buried where. Most didn't bother, and inscriptions, a few had Chinese characters mixed with English, like Chong, question mark, 1916, or Olaf, 1883, 1939. As time passed, the cannery grew around me, so that I grew in the middle of everything. They couldn't shove me off to a corner anymore. It was too late. Bunkhouses and the cannery were below me, the nightlife, which is the bar, the movie house, the dance floor, the restaurant, all in one building, church too on Sundays, of the village to my left, no one notices me. But of course, everyone does not like to be reminded. The best thing they could do was fence me in. Below was the river, which snake-like emptied into the bay far beyond. I'm an old cemetery who hasn't been used lately. Even rats and lean dogs refuse me now. I have been dead, I think, for a long time, never having had a heyday. It's hard to be liked anymore. I don't want to hurry anyone of something that needs no hurrying. No one visits but the wind, whose memory planted those markers, and who knows who's buried where. But who will bury me? Like Bill, the American poet with the Spanish grandmother said, if in passing you bring nothing with you but your carcass, do me a favor, get out and take the long way to the bar. <laughs> OK. Um, I, I, I write uh, prose also besides poems. And this is a, a sort of a, a overview of that experience that I, was, uh, I wanted to say. And, and I wrote it. Uh, I call it sketches of the sun, no, sketches of the midnight sun, sketches of pieces of the midnight sun. It's just the one that has, yeah, this one doesn't have the thing. I have it here. <clears throat> yeah. So I, um, I'm going to sort of tell and read some of this uh, thing. <clears throat> they were the summers of my youth, the summers of life. I started working in Alaska in 1966 when I was just finishing my 21st year. When I came home to San Francisco just before the fall to start school again, I was a father. That was my first year in Alaska. It would be 14 more consecutive summers before I would see what would become my final trip to South Naknek in Bristol Bay, the salmon gold mine of the world. You took three planes to get there. No? Oh, what's this? Wait a minute. I think I pressed something here. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll, 
I'll go on. <clears throat> you took three planes to get there, a big one from Seattle to Anchorage, a 747 sometimes, then a smaller one with about 50 people from Anchorage to King Salmon, a military base, and then a cub plane or a bush plane, which is the most common mode of transportation in Alaska, to the cannery itself. I always liked the ride. It felt like I was in a flying sports car. So I'm going to, uh, there's a, uh, there, there it is. That's how close I was to the ground, you know. First, all right. <clears throat> but remember these images, because I'll go back to it as I read from it there. I'm kind of going fast, but I'll go back to it again. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I could see everything underneath me, and I remember the pilot telling me, well, there she is, a lot of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and true enough, as, my, as far as my eye could see, there was nothing but tundra, low bushes of vegetations for miles and miles and miles, until all of a sudden, some construction made of lumber, for it would contrast with the greens like a naked part of a hairy anatomy, would jump into view, and we would know that the cannery is nearby as towns and buildings and ships and boats emerged and took shape. The airport in which we landed sported a sign, South Naknek International Airport. <laughs> it was nothing but a dust and gravel, one hut or shack of a building with just galvanized roofing and a wooden bench. There, one waited to be taken to the cannery by truck and jeeps and all kinds of transportations dispensable by the cannery at the time of arrival. Usually, the fish had not yet started its run, and at that leisurely time, there was plenty of transportation available from the cannery. I remember one flat truck that I was on one summer early in my years in Alaska. We had stood on the truck, some of us not holding on to anything, hats and bandanas, scarves, and blowing in the dusty wind. That's why I had these bandanas to this, just for, to remind me. Oh, <clears throat> it's very, very uh, useful when you're there. There's a, I remember one flat, uh, um, blowing in the dusty wind, waving goodbye to the place where planes landed. Even the airport was a character in South Naknek. That's the kind of place it was. They say the first time you get to Alaska, it's the company's fault. The second time, and any time after that, it's your fault. <laughs> <clears throat> Another place worth noting was, of course, the lobby of the Filipino bunkhouse. The Indians, Jimmy Walker's crew, so Indian, uh, Jimmy Walker was the foreman of the Indian, uh, William Matsumoto was the foreman of the Japanese crew, the egg, and Marcelino Divina was the foreman of the Filipino crew. So the three foremen, they would, they would tell stories all the time to each other while everybody else was working their ass off, right? <laughs> and somehow, Maybe because I, I, I was uh, I held an affinity for for the old people, uh, so that I also, I, I, thinking about it now, I'm kind of close to the young, to the children of the place and the old old people. That's how I was, and so the same as here. So those three foremen, they would be sitting on a bench, bullshitting the whole time. They're laughing, and then they'd see me. They would call me, and I would say, No, no, boss. I got to work. I'm doing this live watch stuff. So, forget that. There's three other people there. Come over here. I got the story to tell you. 1936. Wasn't that when I was telling you yesterday? It's a 36 or 35. He, <laughs> the guy from 1920s on, he had, they had stories. Jimmy Walker, he had stories of the Native Americans. William Matsumoto of the Japanese. And this one of the Filipino. You know? The three of them. And the three of them were not tall people. You know, they were, I guess, five two or five, I don't know. But they were sitting on that bench. I remember none of their legs were touching the floor. Just like, <laughs> We were all swinging like this. <laughs> but I liked it when they called me, you know, I got off work, <laughs> I listened to them. <clears throat> In the lobby, the Filipino lobby, <clears throat> beside the gamblers, the anglers, the talkers, and the good old fashioned socializers were the great orators. So in this lobby, we would have debates, you know, in, in the Philippines, we had a uh, traditional debate form that's kind of uh, local, you know, we would give you a topic and you say, uh, our immigrants better or worse for the place, you take pro, you take con, and you go at it. But you go at it with verses of poems, with poems. 
in impromptu. So that's how we did it. And they still do it now. It's beautiful to watch. So they try to do it there in the lobby <coughs> with their uh, argument. So it was a balagtasan Alaskan style, a word war of cleverness and wit and information and inspiration, all extemporaneous. Sometimes the audience would help out by calling out the topics or issues for discussion. Have you would see, uh, here you would see your year after year, the same people would be arguing about the same thing. So that's when you can tell uh, this guy really doesn't like this guy. You know, you, you know just like in a poker game or, or in, a, in a, any kind of, you can tell which one, but they just try to keep civil. So here we find out our, our um, so we had the foreman and then the second foreman. Our second foreman, everybody hated his guts, second foreman. I could not hate his guts because he was a close friend of my father. You know. And his wife was a town maid of my father. So I, I really, but then I couldn't encourage his, um, he, he, didn't, he was kind of a selfish person, only thinking of himself and, and acting like he was a company man. You know, he used to call a quote unquote a company man, always thinking of, I saw him one time chase a salmon on, on the, on the um, conveyor belt. With his hand, it was going, and it was already going to get cut. He still chased it, and I said, "I know what's what's the matter with you." He said, "Man, no, no, that I was going to take my glove out because you know the thing, the fish was going to you know." Because I said, "Let it go, I'm, let it go. It's not your money. God damn, let that thing go." He already had, so that was a Benny, um, Mister, and we called him. He gets all excited about every little thing, and that was his nickname, not Mister Excitable, but Mister. Exciting, wrong grammar, but the uh, better name. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but I remember him. <laughs> so that's Manung Benny, Benny Alcantara. <clears throat> and this bunkhouse here, this was our bunkhouse. So upstairs is the, nat the natives bunkhouse. Jimmy Walker's crew upstairs. Downstairs, the Filipino. On my first or second year, I, uh, I, I think I mentioned it. Everybody had some kind of weapons, and I, I was wondering, why well, you guys have this weapon? I didn't know that was. Uh, it's like the Wild West. Was, when, the, when we called for the law, they would come a day after, two days later, depending on the weather. What's the use? Everybody was already hiding, you know. <laughs> so many times they came to me, I had to lie and say, I don't know. I, I don't know anything. I don't know. <clears throat> so anyway, the the native, and on my first year, I uh, I think I had a a pipe under my bed. I don't know what I had. I had to, I had to have something because I don't, I really don't know how to handle a gun. I'm not a gun person, you know. <clears throat> so I had a pipe and, and I heard this noise from upstairs from the, from the native, from the Alaska natives. Really loud noise. I could, and we needed to sleep, you know. Sleep, don't mess with the cannon worker's sleep. You gotta let, the, I couldn't, and then I finally went upstairs. I thought they were having a big party. I thought a dozen guys were, were brawling on each other. So I went upstairs. One guy, one guy was making all the noise. He was drunk. He came home. It was Jimmy Walker, Jimmy Walker's son, Kenny Walker. So he was drunk. And I went upstairs and I said, Kenny, what the hell are you doing? No, please don't tell on me. So he was, he was crying. So it was crazy, you know. Violence is such an unexplainable thing to us, especially when you're young, you know. You cannot explain it. A lot of people who were violent men started crying. You know, this guy was one of them. Another one was uh, a friend of mine, too. After he hit me and gave me a black eye because I was breaking a fight, he started crying. I said, you hit me? You, 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 what are you crying for? <laughs> you started apologizing. <clears throat> OK, <clears throat> that was Boy Sigi Sigi. I mentioned him already. So this was our, our bunkhouse. Here's another, uh, this guy here. You know how people say, well, you, you, you're so-and-so, especially so -so our women, you know, our, our Asian women, they look younger than they, they look like they're 12 for, not, uh, for 50 years. You know, they look like they're 12. <laughs> This guy here, I think, is about, <laughs> I don't know, he was about 70 years old then, but he always looked young, this guy. <clears throat> and there's the crew, how's like this crew. You, um, you really have to find some kind of uh, good attitude to, uh, to work uh, this experience as well, because otherwise, you know, you won't, you won't like it. 
There's our bunkhouse there. I remember, oh yeah, there's a pointer here. Pointer? Oh yeah, I think this is the red one, no, Jackie? Yeah. yeah. So this one here, uh, this is uh, the entrance of the bunkhouse. Our, this, our, the Filipinos is the Native American. So this, this, this person who was a, a killer, a tough guy, you know, I was at the door. He was, I found him at the door there one midnight and he was, everybody was afraid of him. You know, he owed about 12 and was gambling too in, in, the, in the cannery. People sometimes owed their whole paycheck before the work started and this guy, this guy was one of them, a friend of mine. Because he was in the same hometown as me and I spoke the same language, I was really the only one that could reach him. So he was said that after midnight, came, I came home from the lie wash whenever I caught him there not wanting to go in the house. I said, Freddy, what's wrong? How come you're not going in the house? And he was shaking. What's wrong? He said, no, I think, I think there's some ghosts in there. The guy was scared of the dark. He was scared of the dark. I, I was scared of the dark, but I was only six at the time. You know, I, I, I all grew it. But this guy apparently believed in supernatural things. And, and, I, and I told him, why don't you go in? He said, I'm hungry. I want to go to the, I want to go get some food, but I, I don't want to go in because there's some ghosts out there. So I went out there and pretended I shoot the ghosts out. And then he went. You know? <laughs> And he paid, he paid the money that he owed me. <clears throat> That's Freddy Eagle. And Eagle is not the eagle that you think it is. It's um, I-G-L-E. Iglesias was his last name. He just cut the name to I-G-L-E and made it Freddy Eagle. Made it sound like he was Aguila, you know. <clears throat> okay, I think, is this it? Oh, I press something again. Ah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> there was a um, um, belief that I think I experienced it, but I'm not sure. It was that, that, that if you, um, I spoke about the, uh, the, the relationship of the men and women in, in the cannery during two or three months, during the six weeks that we were there. I heard from the old man that in the old days, if you had bedded down with a native woman, um, you slept with her more than the usual. Um, the people there will expect you to be there when the baby comes out, you know. So the community really um, impressed it upon the Alaska Packers people to please uh, help hold those people responsible, those men responsible. And many of my friends would said that, and this is a. Uh, <clears throat> an article that I wrote about for a Valentine's um, Day um, issue that they had, because they asked me, Oscar, you know, you, you write about Alaska and you talk about it. Those guys, do they ever have any, uh, I don't know, love relationships, those Alaskaeros? I said, plenty. And so I wrote this, Lust Among the Ruins. <clears throat> and, and this is one of the stuff, two, I'm going to tell you two things from it. One is, um, you know, which, one was that? which one is this one now? What was I talking about? Um, it's the one that your friend did the drawings. Yeah, okay, he, yeah. No, the word, uh, talking about grammar, the word him, it's a pronoun, right, him. But the Filipinos here, they made it a verb because of the situation I'm taking. The native woman would ask, uh, so before we would go home, when it was going home time, and if you had bedded with a woman, uh, that woman would be there on the plane uh, when we were all getting ready to get on. Uh, they inspected two things. One is the people who stole cans, who would steal cans to, to the planes. You know, in my opinion, my, uh, why, why do they check people stealing five or six or 10 cans when we stole cases during the season? You know, <laughs> I put it in the mail, uh, in the post office. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> but this, the superintendent was just bothered by it, so he was there. He was expecting, so the cans, and also the second one is if any of the men had bedded with the Alaskan woman <clears throat> at the time, and she would be there with the trooper, and she would point him out. Huh? <laughs> there it is. Wow. And she would say, him. And that pronoun him became a verb. What happened to, what happened to Oscar last, Oscar, he got him last season. 
him, him. So it was, it was a, I, I didn't quite, but they, they, sw they swore it was still happening. This is in San Francisco. They also found me in San Francisco. They have a maritime academy in Fisherman's Wharf. Somehow they got a hold of me, and this is the latest picture of this ship, which was famous for going to Alaska um, in its heydays, the, ba the Balclutha, the Balclutha. But I wanted to go back to this, uh, this one here. And the other story of this guy, uh, um, of Johnny Mamiamiana. No, no, I don't know if you can pronounce that name. Johnny Mamiami. I told the story because I, I taught college also. I, I would work in the summers in the farms in Alaska, and then I would go home in, in San Francisco and be a student or be a teacher. Because that, that was so. I was telling this story to my uh, to my class one time, and the uncle of the of this per, uh, the nephew of this person was in the audience. I didn't know that happens a few times. But this is the story of Johnny Mamiamiana. Mamiamiana means, is any Filipino? Pardon me? A little later on. You got it, you got it. <clears throat> so uh, there was a practice, even in my days, that when you, uh, you, you work in Alaska after the season, you, 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 know, you have all this cash with you, some of the older men go to the Philippines and fetch a bride and bring them back here. Happens a few times. One Johnny one was Johnny. He got this nickname a little later on, Mamiamiana, uh, because of this incident. <clears throat> His real name was Johnny Natividad. <clears throat> okay. So Johnny, after he uh, goes to the Philippines, gets a bride, marries her there, then still on the boat. So they, he brings her here on the boat. When she gets here, my friend who was telling me the story asked, Oh, Johnny. You have a young wife there. Huh? You better, you know, watch watch your health. You know, you you don't know what's what's going to happen. You know, a heart attack. And uh, Johnny said, "No. Uh, in fact, we we've never we've never really done it uh, yet. You mean the whole trip was about twenty days? When, uh, when, no, no, it's not consummated yet, uh, Mary. You know, I, I've been trying to, but she keeps giving excuses. <laughs> so, uh, he would say." He would get up in the morning, you know, he would nudge her, honey, now. He said, now? Mamiya miyana, Johnny. <laughs> I still have to cook. I still have to iron the clothes. I still have to hang it up. He said, where is it? Is this here? Where did she go? Oh, it's there again. <laughs> it's there again. It's there again. <laughs> my, my elbow is hitting it, I think. So. There we go. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's him. That's another one. Yeah, there she is. I still have to hang up clothes, you know? So Johnny says, okay. <clears throat> a little later during lunchtime, you know, she saw Johnny coming to, towards her. And before he would ask her, she would say, Johnny, mami ana, okay? Mami ana. <laughs> a little later. And then one day when Johnny got up, he was frustrated. He nudged her and she said, honey, we just got up. Come on, mami. Mami Anna later on, and I said, no, ngayon na, now, and Mami Amiana, both. <laughs> so, so, so Johnny was famous for having the role reversal. We thought that the woman was young, she would still have the sexual libido active, but it was Johnny who was under, uh, out of control with his libido. <laughs> so I will read uh, just a, a few more parts of that, that experience, no? Cliff Johnson, we had a bar, Cliff Johnson there. Cliff Johnson was the richest man in South Naknek, Alaska. He uh, owned uh, more properties than all the superintendents, and he, um, he married, um, I forgot her name, Irene, I think. Uh, she, he had a family there in South Naknek. The building that, that I described earlier as the church, uh, the bar, belonged to Cliff Johnson, and on that cliff was, was called Johnson's Cliff. <clears throat> um, I'll... I'll Cliff Johnson's bar was called the Long Branch Saloon in local folklore. It was not, the only, was not the only one so christened. In fact, if one really thought about it, there was hardly anything in South Naknek, probably in Alaska, that was not renamed or rechristened. Huh? 
I had a different name. You know, everybody had a different name. You know, but <clears throat> then there was a male. When you're in an enclosed, uh, um, enclosed uh, compound like the cannery, you know, the male is important. But the trouble is, when you're in an enclosed uh, position like that, rumors start going around because there's no news. So you really have to depend. What did he say? No, they said this. And the male was one of the first one that got me all confused. You know? Then there was the male, the blessings of which drop it from heaven but once a week. The male was once a week. Usually, in a manner of speaking, that is. Depends on the weather, really. If the weather was nice, sometimes it would come twice a week. In fact, that was the consistent characteristic of the male there, inconsistency of its arrivals. <laughs> One day in my rookie year, confounded by this, I set out to find the answer for myself. I asked our foreman. He said, once or twice a week, the mail comes. Just to confirm things, I asked the store clerks, schoolboys, and they said Mondays only, and Wednesdays and Fridays. <laughs> wow, like those classes in school, they said. <laughs> the mechanics told me Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> the cooks, weekends only. He told me weekends only, and the carpenters, never on weekends, they told me. So I was really confused, only on weekdays. He said. Frustrated, I went to the radio man, the guy who, who, who wires the, the plane landing in, so that he would know for sure. I went to the radio man and said, I said, Joe, when does the mail come in, man? He said, don't ask me, I just work here. <laughs> so I don't know when the mail comes in. <clears throat> so that was the story of the mail there. <clears throat> <clears throat> I wanted to read a part of a friend of mine that I met, this uh, Rick Williams. I think I was telling um, Jackie that part. Let me look for it here. <clears throat> um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Rick Wilson. Rick Williams was a real name. I, I, I said Rick Wilson in this story because the guy might sue me, you know. <clears throat> but he's a good friend of mine. I like the guy. <clears throat> I haven't seen him for uh, maybe a, a half a century, maybe. <clears throat> Rick, Will Rick Wilson was a white man from New York. People would go to him and say things about New York City, like, hey, how's Broadway? Or the Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty? And he'll say, never seen any of them, man. I'm from upstate New York. New York is a state too, not just a city, he would say. He used to piss him off all the time when people always, because he never saw New York City. From New York, he went straight to Alaska. <clears throat> so he would smile. Troy, New York, he would say. That's near Albany, the capital city of New York. Rick Wilson was into the drama of things, the moment, the ridiculousness of experience. He's a little older than me. Huh? He visited me once, and when he passed by in San Francisco before he took, took the trip back home to New York, Troy, New York, he was somewhat apprehensive. He was to meet his parents, his adopted parents, that is, after being almost gone for about 10 years from them. He stayed with me in San Francisco for several days, and this was the time the flower children, you know, because everybody was going to San Francisco, he wanted to check it out, so he stayed with me there in my little apartment with my two kids and my wife. Uh, uh, so he stayed with me in San Francisco for several days. Then he moved on to New York. He took the plane. He left me his MG Roadster. Roadster is a sports car, a Triumph. It was a convertible, sporty, but beat up. He told me that if he didn't come back in three weeks, it's yours. <laughs> That's how it was in those days. It's crazy. <clears throat> and he left me the keys. What the hell? It was the early 70s, and the people were into existentialism and Sartre and Camus. He came back before the three weeks was up, though. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most memorable events, incidents, and there were more than a few with Rick the Stick. I called him Rick the Stick because in Kodiak, I met him again you know, my second season, and he was playing pool, and he was outside challenging everybody to play pool, and he was one of the lousiest pool player in the world. <laughs> I don't see this, but he, uh, even I can beat him. And I was just average. <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> was, was, so I called him Rick the Stick. <clears throat> was the very first time I met him. And now we lost $6,000 right in front of my eyes. About, in about half an hour, we lost it all. Uh, man, 
<clears throat> Men on the boardwalk in Kodiak were playing dice. Rick was the kind that always wanted to get involved, participate. I remember in the nightclubs of Kodiak that we occasionally visited, he would always call out to the older over the hill performers, not the young ladies. He would pick out the ones that's kind of more mature, you know, there, and he would zero in on it and give her all the compliments that he could, not the young girl. You know? So Rick, Rick was like that. Yeah. Entertaining, straining his neck, he would say, you, you're the one for me, baby. Where have you been all my life? I'd like to kiss your belly button from the inside out. <laughs> you drive me to a frenzy of unspeakable desires. He was, good. He was a good reader, too, Rick Williams. <laughs> Strangely enough, there was a gentleman about him and his attitude towards women, especially. In fact, he often got taken for a ride by many a young trickster. But the amazing thing about Rick Wilson was that he would forgive in an instant, and he would forgive repeatedly. He was one white man who was a close, though brief, friend of mine, and one of the very few whom I ended up trusting. Maybe it was because we lost about $6,000 once in a crapshoot. <laughs> we had $200 each, and we, of course it was actually only he, had challenged everybody into taking our money with a quick die shoots. We have $400 right here. Everybody take our money out, come over here. <clears throat> we got $400 right here, gentlemen, yours for the taking. What do you say? Let's shoot some dice. And right then and there on the docks, on the waterfront boardwalks, creaking with the sway of the sea, he took off his jacket and started rolling the dice. And confidently, <clears throat> and then told me, give me your 200, man. And he quit, <laughs> what could I do? The fishermen were in town, fresh from cashing in on their catch. Everybody had big bucks, and the money was loose like a long-necked goose, as Rick the Stick liked to quote the big bopper of the late 50s. Here it is, Rick, I said, go get him. And Rick was hot that late afternoon. His left hand was burning. In about three passes, three winnings, we had close to $1,000. After that, I started to lose count, and it didn't matter anymore because Rick was just throwing one pass after another, getting his number every time, and no sevens were coming out. Surprisingly, we were looking at over $2,000 in front of us, and we, that is Rick, had thrown eight passes already. I think I'm good for another one, he said. What do you say, partner? He would turn to me, confident and ebullient. What could I say, right? <laughs> Let it roll, fuck it, that's what I said. <laughs> and he rolled and rolled until he got his number again. Rick the stick asked the pit boss, long arm Charlie for the count. Pit boss Charlie was only too good, to, too glad to accommodate anything to stop the flow of luck that had bitten this young white man with a lot of gray hair. He had a lot of gray hair for that. <clears throat> Hopefully this would stop the rhythm and change the luck. So long arm Charlie asked his boys to count the money we had $6,420 in front of us. Hey, I feel 10 is my number, he said. We'll let it roll one more time. And the number 10 showed up at his point. Though the numbers 10 and 4 are the hardest, most difficult numbers to get, that's when he got really confident that he was going home with about $13,000. See, the number 10 is our number, he was explaining to me. And this is the 10th. It is all written, Oscar. Pal, all written in our destiny. But it didn't happen. <laughs> he sevened out. And we watched them rake in all the money that was, out, that was ours just seconds ago. I wanted to stop at nine passes. I wanted to tell him so, but I couldn't. I didn't want to spoil a quality of experience that he really strove to live for. So we lost all our money that night. It was only $200 that we lost, really. What's $200? But what do you think it all means? I said, Rick, Rick the stick, what do you think it all means? I was forced to ask him. I mean, we had everything, and then nothing. Gold already, and it somehow turned into shit. Why me? Why us? What is it, Rick? What's it all mean? 
how fuck if I know, he says. <laughs> <coughs> Rick the Stick would give that sudden laugh. His hawk nose would twitch a bit and the gray hairs. What does it all mean? I don't know, Rick would say, and I laugh at the same time. At least, he said, we had something to lose, huh? <laughs> Think of all the fuckers in the world who had nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Kid, we are lucky for having had so much to lose, even only for a moment, he told me. Our whole lives are only for a moment anyways, right? He would burst out in uncontrollable laughter. Well, you can't win them all, he said. And I told him he reminded me of my uncle, the boxer who fought 119 fights and lost 119 of them. <laughs> and when I asked him why and how, all he said was, you can win all of them, son. <laughs> yes, $200, $6,000, what's the difference? I've squandered more in pettier things, and much more in counterproductive kalokohans, trivial things. One night, one of the last nights that I saw him, he confided in me. He had been awfully, unusually quiet. He had not been his usual rowdy self. It was his last night on shore, for they would be leaving in the morning fishing for several days to a couple of weeks. <clears throat> he told me, Kristen, he told me, is going to be at my place while I'm gone. Kristen was his girlfriend at the time. It's not too far out of the way for you. Look in on her every now and then, he asked me. Sure, I said, sure, don't worry. It's not going to, ha uh, and he paused quite Quite definitely, he paused and he said, and you know, if, if she'd want to do it with you, it's okay with me. You know, he would say, <laughs> I just, I just want to let you know, really, he said. Rick, it's not going to happen, I said, don't worry. That young white woman, Kristen, that Rick spoke of was the girlfriend of another guy that I know, Bobby Gomez, right? <laughs> Bobby Gomez is an ex-Philippine movie idol star. It was Romeo Vasquez, his real name, but I called him Bobby Gomez here. And he walked across, the red salmon, he walked across from me. He was sli slimer, as a slimer. <clears throat> so anyways, uh, she, Kristen, was the girlfriend of that, so she had two boyfriends. Rick was one of them. It could have been before, maybe, that he, she met Rick, or after, or during, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure. This boyfriend was called Bobby Gomez, and he was a movie star in the Philippines in the 60s and the 70s, but somehow, because of a combination of Fate, luck, character, bad judgment, regrettable decisions were made, and he found himself in the salmon fishing canneries of Alaska and their nearby towns. Bobby Gomez worked as a slimer in the cannery, the Red Salmon Fish Company, across the river from us. So <clears throat> I got a personal postcard from Rick the Stick one time, a long time after this, out of the blue. Hadn't heard from him for years. In the card was a cut off folded copy of a poem that I wrote. And in that poem, I had mentioned his name, I had mentioned him, some shared experiences with him. He wrote on it saying, I was taking a crap in a public restroom one day in Oregon, and I saw this cast aside in a corner, and when I looked, it had a poem that you wrote. <laughs> The poem wasn't worth a fuck, but it's nice to be remembered, he said. <laughs> Thanks, Rick the Stick. <laughs> <clears throat> and I would, uh, <clears throat> so that was, I was there 15 consecutive years, 15 consecutive summers, and two or three of those I had double seasons, so I really had 18 to 19 uh, canneries that I worked in during the 15 years. No? At about the seventh year, I finally had the discipline. The seventh year, I finally had the discipline to bring a camera and take pictures. Because I knew it was something historic. It was part of the, that I told you that I was finding my voice. I knew something was fading away and something new was coming in, something was leaving, something. I knew there was something, I could feel it. You know? but, and I knew I had to take pictures, but I, I'm not the type to take pictures. Maybe because I write, I, I figured in my head I can just write about it. You know? But I'm sorry I didn't take those pictures. And then seventh year, I said, I'm going to just go out of characters, take pictures everywhere I go. 
So I brought a camera and took pictures. I pushed myself to take pictures of as many aspects of canon life as I could. I took about 20 rolls of film, and I finished those 20 rolls too. When I got back to Seattle, a friend offered to develop the films free for me, all of it, because he had gotten some grant money for a project. I gave him all 20 rolls, and I waited for the film. But I didn't hear a word from him for a while. When after a month had passed, I asked him. He said he had lost it. He said he did not know what happened, but the roles of the films, along with some other items of his group, just did not come back. I was crushed, as still I am. But then I said to myself, this is why you know you must write about them. <clears throat> that is why you hear me now, and that is why I know that I will once again return to that distant land, though perhaps in a different time, when times have changed, because that's the nature of time. I don't know, and I don't know which is more distant to me now, the land or the time. Thank you. I'm sorry. But. No, that's a good question because it happens every time I go there. You know, I, uh, I, I smell the smell for about 20 minutes, then I don't smell anything anymore. Yeah. I think scientifically your olfactory glands somehow get used to it and it doesn't bother you anymore. Until now, canned salmon, I eat anytime. You know, most people, since you work with salmon, you must be sick of it. I said, no. It's still one of the, my best food. <laughs> I, I have a question to, oh, yes, there. Oh, hi, Oscar. Hi. Hey. Oh, oh, hello. I'm sorry, I was here earlier. My plane got delayed, and we sat in Sitka for five hours. Yes, I know. Oh. Gary Johnson, he was, yes. Um, he and Oscar about the, the same age. Yes. And uh, my dad is, was the assistant superintendent with Oscar mm -hmm. at the cannery. And of course, he's, he's been retired, so he's uh, hanging out at the hotel after his flight on for a few days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Then your dad was the assistant superintendent. I remember him clearly, and he was um, he was a good man. I, we uh, workers remember the superintendents by um, how good they treat the workers or how good they're they're, they're uh, and um, the South Naknek. They had different kinds of superintendents, but superintendents, but not one was really uh, anti-worker. You know, but I was a union representative for several times, but some of the foremen sometimes were anti-workers, uh, and I had a, a few arguments with them because during that time was the time of the 60s and the 70s, it was the hippy dippy time, you know, the time of the the time of the long hair. I think my picture there, I, I didn't even recognize myself. I don't know where they got that picture. I had long hair. You know? <clears throat> it was the time of the long hair, and one of the arguments always was the management was always telling somehow the guys to cut their hair off because, you know, the fish and health-wise, they had a point. But I said, you can always put a hairnet on them, you know. You don't have to cut the guy's hair off because you're really infringing on somebody's right. Why don't you just put it? And so they did put hairnet, so it was okay, you know. And for us, we sort of look at superintendents that way. We look at them in blocks and we hardly get to know them. I was uh, one of the few workers who got to eat with some of the staff uh, uh, in the blue room, they call it the blue room. They have a blue room too in South Nacrec. And I, I talked to all of them. They're they're all, but there was always a time that they had an argument with the foreman or or or, um, or one of the workers. I rem remember the time when they ex uh, in inspecting for cans. This was, was this not Gary? G Gary might remember this guy. His name is Phillips, another superintendent. Oh, Gary yeah. probably remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. probably remember. Yeah. And one of the Filipinos, um, he was about, he was one of these guys who was um, under five foot, but he was like a fire plug. He was built like a fire plug. I had an arm wrestle with him. I could not budge him. As big as I was, he was his name was Kelly. You know? <clears throat> so Kelly was caught twice. One, smuggling liquor, and two, <laughs> smuggling salmon out from the cannery when we were going home. First time when he got caught smuggling that liquor, I, uh, it was before my time. It was during the war, was, uh, and uh, I guess the, he was told. Uh, Mr. Phillips uh, told him, "You cannot sell liquor here or bring it here. Don't you know there's a goddamn war going on in Fort Bailey? This is in Fort Bailey, Port Bailey. I don't know." And Kelly said. I know there's a war going on, Mr. Kelly, but there's no war here in Port Valley. <laughs> so that's when he sold. And that Tim Kelly was the one who smuggled, tried to smuggle the, the cannery. And that's why, you see how the, the relationship, how when my, the Filipino foreman sort of defended, defended him taking cans out from the car, he'd say, what you, can I see what you have in your bag? Kelly would say, no, that's against the law, Mr. Phillips. It's not, this is a private company, and they argue it's a private company, I can see whatever you want, what do you have in there? It's none, it's none of your business, you know, it's like, that. let me see, can you shake it? He shook it, bunch of tin cans, <laughs> <laughs> some salmon was shaking there. He said, what's in there? My underwear, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, people like uh, my, my foreman and probably your dad would, would step in between and the two and say, you know, Mr. Phillips, you really should just leave him alone and take those salmon to Seattle because he's, that's free advertisement. That's free advertisement for a thing. He said, okay. So, so, you know, you need foreman to always work between management and workers, you know. Yes, dear. Can you tell me a little bit more about Jimmy Walker? Yeah. Yes, yes, from from Cochibu, from uh, all kinds of uh, um, many people, and I befriended almost all of them. Somehow they thought I was an Indian too. Maybe because I told them I was an Indian. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> they would ask what tribe I was, and I tr and name them a tribe from the Philippines. You know, and they'd say, "Wow, I never heard of that one." Yeah. <laughs> but Jimmy Walker uh, was the foreman of the Indian crew the, around the same time as the Filipino Divina, because the two were always talking. Remember this guy, really? Um, uh, Jimmy, remember this guy? So they were for a long, long time. And his, he would bring some of his family there and different people from the villages. But he was always a, I hardly had any worker complaining about Jimmy. But then sometimes I think he was a little 
too soft, you know. Jimmy was a, was a good guy. And uh, his main problem was his son, the guy who was drunk and who was making all that racket. That was his, his son, yeah. But he was okay too. He just. Uh, yes, dear. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the some of the different uh, racial groups that you mm -hmm. had and about the mm -hmm. shift of women entering the mm -hmm. workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's not always straightforward. Yeah. Things being separate or yes. Yeah. Can you talk about your experience? Sure, sure. Those yeah, you know the institutions were there, but the people uh, who were living in the institutions um, di did not uh, did not have to be uh, captive of those inst racist institutions. So I know the machinists had their own buildings. You know, I can go there if people want to go there. It's not that. But they had their own building. They had, and then the office crew. They had their own building. The Filipinos had. Their, so I know that there was some kind of um, a, a racist institutionalism placed there already. No, but you see, if you realize there's that thing happening, you can do two things, and you can do both really. One is to sort of dismantle it from from the top, which is kind of difficult for the workers. But if you're a worker. You have to sort of work within your own province of dealing with the racism. And the many different uh, races that were in the, in the cannery knew that that was a rule that was harder than the rules that the institutions have put. It's, it's a, it's a, you can say, for example, that, uh, oh, there it is again. <laughs> you can say, that, for example, that um, uh, the Filipinos uh, had um, not, what do you call it? Um, they didn't have the the uh, the gas always didn't work. Our our, our bunkhouse, uh, you know, where the the heater I don't know what you call it, the one that heats up the place, the hot water, uh, and was in the bunkhouse. It exploded two or three times each season. The thing exploded while the while well, the mess machinist was there. The, uh, the white machinist was there. His name is Bernie. Was really close to us. Um, he was always there. He would, thing would explode. He'd come out all black and, so and sooty, you know. I said, Bernie, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It was just this. So we worked around the racist, the, ra the racist institution that were there. That guy, Bernie, to me, and just like Rick Williams, um, um, I was saying that even though the Filipinos had very little power, when it came to food, we were number one. Everybody knew it. We threw a party twice in the beginning and at the end of the season. We, we ordered our food from Chinatown in Seattle. We would freeze it when we get there. And when the time would come, we would throw a feast at the end of the season. And if we didn't like you, we won't invite you. <laughs> you know, hardly any of those was Bernie, always number one. Bernie, always number one. <laughs> so that's how we dealt with it. I'm glad you're from some, I, I was close with many of the children of South Naknek too. And what is your name, dear? She's from South, South Naknek also, right? Or from Naknek, across, okay. across the river. Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> I had, uh, <clears throat> but anyways, yeah. And um, Katie, your dad, how, how, how is he? I mean, how, how old is he now? He's in his mid-70s. Oh, mid yeah, that's right. That, we were the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly the same age as me. Yes, exactly the same. Yeah, he, he just came up from Phoenix all day, so he looked tired. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm tired too. <laughs> 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 I understand, yeah. But that's one thing about your, your plane. I, my plane got delayed also. Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> Mm. Interesting ways, you know, thinking about the smells, you know, and the mm. sounds of, of the cannery. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it's just really, um, really special. Yeah. Well, I, I always, that's an experience to me that um, I would wish on that everybody should, if they can, they should, they should try it. But I don't know whether it's still, how are the canneries now? Is it reduced in numbers? I, I, I don't know.
Wow. Wow. Well, the, Wow. Yes, uh, I'll, be, I'll be walking down San Francisco or some villages in the Philippines, and all of a sudden, hey man, that was that was Bristol Bay. You know, I I, I know, I, I feel. That music, the sound. The yes, music. yeah. Is it true that they the part of the union negotiations included records and phonograph music with the companies? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, in Kodiak, um, this is for another. Uh, another uh, presentation, but in Kodiak when I was in jail, <coughs> <laughs> uh, I was doing my master, my master's, the year of my master's, so I asked the, the it was a small jail in Kodiak, it was like um, uh, Andy Griffith type, I had fun, you know, <coughs> but anyways, that's another story. Uh, the, um, what was that, what, 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 what did you ask, Katie? The music, the music, yeah. So they let me keep my books. I had books under my bed there and my music. I was listening to it in, in jail. And once in a while, um, I would ask, uh, um, and I befriended uh, one of the cops there, who was young, young, young cop. He asked me, what do you got in those books there? Because I want to I wanna, I wanna start you know, reading a book. I know that uh, books are a good thing. I just don't know how to, what kind to pick, you know. <clears throat> So I said, well, what kind are you interested in? This young, white, uh, cardiac guy. He said, well, you know, I'm interested in racial relationships, races, said, because we don't have too much of that articulation here, although it's here. I want to know how the language of, oh, yeah, I got a book for you. I said, I took, I was thinking of one. I took one, Uhuru. It's called Uhuru. It means freedom <laughs> in uh, Kenya. It's during the Mau Mau uprising. It's in the movie, too, Sidney Poitier and Rock Hudson, in case you want to see it. <clears throat> but he read it, and two weeks later, he came back, well, give me another one. So I said, no, I'm the one in jail. You got to do me a favor this time. Every time I get you a book, please give me a hamburger, because in jail, you eat what they give you. You know, you don't ask for a menu. <laughs> so I missed that hamburger, and he brought me the best hamburger every time. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.